How's it going, everybody? You guys good today? Yeah, yeah. I uh, want to just say hello to everybody gathered across all of our locations. And if you're joining us online, welcome. And if you have a Bible, go ahead and find Daniel chapter 4. Today, I've got a tall task in front of me. I'm going to try to uh, get through all of chapters 4 and 5 today uh, to set us up for our study in chapter 6 next week. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and get to chapter 4. And as you're turning there, uh, I just want to give you one last kind of call out. If you have not signed up for our, the fall semester of Rooted, today's the last day. And uh, we've only got a handful of spots left in that except for the downtown campus. Downtown, you have filled every single spot and rooted, so way to go. Uh, but uh, for the rest of you, uh, there's only a handful of spots left and I want to encourage you to get in. And rooted, is, you know, some of you might be like, well, what in the world is that? Is that some sort of botany class? And it's like, no, uh, it's, it's uh, designed to do what it's called, like is to help root you to your faith, to know why you believe what you believe, which is really, really pertinent to what we've been studying in this Daniel series. And so I can't recommend it highly enough. Our entire staff have been through it. I've been through it and uh, you're not going to want to miss out on it. However, some of you might be like, I just can't swing it to fall semester. Too many things going on. Um, we're going to run it back in January of next year. So you might just tuck that away, put that in your calendar. Uh, what a great way to kick off the new year. If you can't do the fall semester, maybe you can jump in with this in January. Well, uh, really, really hard to believe, but we are at about the halfway point in our study in Daniel. And if you're just now joining us, we've been calling this among lions. And what we've been doing is we've just been walking our way through uh, the story of a life of a guy by the name of Daniel, who lives faithfully for God within a very godless culture for roughly 70 years of his life. And uh, he is tested in a variety of ways and at times, but Daniel continues to live out his faith in ways that are uncompromising and unmistakable. And oftentimes as Christ followers, when we find ourselves kind of in this midst of like kind of cultural and societal pressure, we can find ourselves maybe going one of two ways. And I've been guilty of both, where maybe we just find ourselves sort of withdrawing and isolating from the culture. Like, I, I don't want to engage. I just kind of want to sit back and not, not get wrapped up in it. Uh, others of us, though, maybe we uh, kind of lean a little too far in and maybe we assimilate to the culture and there really isn't anything all that distinct about the way that we live in their li our lives. What Daniel does is he provides this model for us for how to live for God within a very godless culture in a way that earns the respect of those who are far from God. And the Babylonian authorities, they just keep noticing how Daniel conducts himself. And so he just keeps getting these promotions over and over again and a seat at the table to have this tremendous influence. Now, here's why this like matters for us today. The same spirit of Babylon that existed then is the same spirit of Babylon that exists today behind every nation and kingdom um, among men throughout time. However, the same spirit of God that lived within Daniel that helped him live a distinct life is the same spirit of God that lives within you today. And Daniel knew, 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I want you to take heart in that. I, I've heard from so many of you already in this series, you're just like, man, this study has been so relevant and so timely with where we're living our lives. That's why. And so we're not overcome by the spirit of this world. We know that the spirit of the living God lives within us and we can prevail regardless of the circumstances. Now, as we come to chapters four and five, we're gonna find God confronting the pride that existed in a guy that by this point, we're very, very familiar with in our study, King Nebuchadnezzar. But he's also gonna confront the pride of Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, a guy by the name of Belshazzar. And we're actually gonna see that uh, God is confronting the pride within you and me as well. Now, um, maybe some of you recall the story of um, one of the greatest, if not the greatest boxers of all time, Muhammad Ali who was on an airplane one time, he's flying to an engagement. They get into a little bit of turbulence. The captain comes on and says, hey, I need everybody to fasten their seatbelt. And Ali refuses. And the stewardess comes up to him and she says, sir, I really need you to fasten your seatbelt. And Ali famously said to her, some of you might recall, he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which she automatically said, Superman don't need no airplane. All right. <laughs> and I love that story. I hope it's true. Uh, and I, I'm thinking about that, you know, I don't know that I've ever been that brash. I couldn't back it up if I was, but I've never been that brash. But that doesn't mean that I haven't been that prideful. 
And that's kind of like a mega theme of chapters like four and five as we come into this, is that God is confronting the pride that is in all of our hearts. Now, I want to clarify something, is that when I say God wants to confront the pride in your life and in mine, some of you might be like, no, wait a second. Like, I thought that it was a good thing to have self-confidence. Like, I thought it was a good thing to have a healthy self-esteem. And it is. So when I say that God wants to confront your pride, I'm not talking about having a, you know, a healthy sense of self-esteem. When I say pride, I'm talking about that toxic sense of self-reliance that exists in and all, within all of us. That like sense of maybe like superiority or entitlement that often stems from our insecurities. It's an overcompensation for our fears. It's that little Nebuchadnezzar that lives inside of all of us trying to build our own personal kingdoms and empires without or apart from God. And pride is a really sinister, tricky thing that is at work in all of our lives. It is much more sinister than just playground arrogance or cockiness. See, here's the dangerous thing about pride, is that uh, pride can cause me to appear humble. The crazy thing is that it's pride that's actually prompting me to do that because I want you to see me as humble. You see how that works? Uh, in pride, I can appear really generous, but pride is my motivation because I know that other people are watching. I can come across as caring, but it's pride that's pushing me to get a leg up. And oftentimes when I'm defensive, insecure, or easily offended, if I stop and just pay attention to what's going on underneath the surface of my heart, I realize that what's at the root of all those things is my pride. Pride not only keeps you and me from becoming the kind of person that God wants you to be, made you to be, that for G who Jesus died for you to be, but it also damages my relationships with others, and ultimately my relationship with God. You have an interpersonal thing that goes down in your life and a relationship falls apart, chances are pride is the culprit, either yours or theirs or both. Which is why I think pride is listed in the book of Proverbs as one of the things that God despises. And he despises it because of what it does in us, to us, and around us. Uh, pride is also one of these things that is really, really easy to see in other people, isn't it? Like how many of you right now, like you can think of a prideful person in your life. You're just like, oh, yep, I got them. I hope they listen to this message. I'm sending them the link this afternoon. <laughs> right? It's like, you know, we, we are very well aware of the prideful people in our lives, but um, usually we're the last one to see it in our own lives. It's like this, this blind spot. And scripture just backs that up. Obadiah verse 3 says, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Like, like you, you just don't see it. Or maybe we see it, but we call it other things. Well, it's like, well, it's just ambition. Or I'm just trying to provide. Or I'm trying to accomplish something great. Uh, Proverbs chapter 16 says that pride goes before destruction. And that haughtiness before a fall. It is always that thing in our lives that precedes a fall of some kind. It's kind of like that um, game Jenga. You remember that game? Man, that game has caught, I mean, uh, there's nothing enjoyable about that game. <laughs> it's like, hey, let's just relax and play a little Jenga. Like it's just a, this anxiety producing. I, play the, I played this with my kids when they were little. I'm like, I better start saving for their counseling because this is so anxiety producing. And what happens in Jenga, like the, this tower of like wooden blocks is exactly kind of an illustration of pride is that we pull from the foundation to build higher and higher and higher. And that all the while the foundation is weakening until the whole thing collapses. C.S. Lewis famously put it this way. He said, pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Or, as my grandma put it, pride is acting like I know so, even when it is not so, in order that it might be so, simply because I said so. All right? <laughs> Thank you, Grandma. I'll never forget it. All right? So as we come to chapters 4 and 5, as I said, God is going to confront the pride of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. And um, I said this a few weeks ago, that oftentimes when we read these Old Testament narratives, it's very, very easy to put ourselves in the sandals of the hero. You know, it's like we read this and we're like, oh, I'm clearly Daniel. And, you know, my boss or my neighbor is Nebuchadnezzar. What I really want to challenge you to do is do what I've done this last week and simply say, you know what, maybe I'm not Daniel in this narrative. Maybe I'm Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe I'm Belshazzar. What, what, is there any pride, sinister pride that I'm blinded to that God 
is trying to confront in me. A great summary of the book of Daniel could be this. It is one big epic story of God's kingdom versus human empires. And what we've been uh, looking at over the last three weeks, we've already covered the first three chapters, is there is like this back and forth. Like if Daniel is kind of an illustration for how to live faithfully for God in a godless culture, Nebuchadnezzar is an illustration of how God pursues human hearts. There's this like back and forth going on where it's as if God is fighting for the very soul of Nebuchadnezzar. Because you see him, like God works in dramatic ways through Daniel and his friends. And you see Nebuchadnezzar's heart starts to soften. And then all of a sudden it hardens again. And it's just like this back and this forth, not unlike you and me. And so we saw this last week where, you know, Nebuchadnezzar builds this statue after having a dream in which Daniel interpreted it and said, hey, this is representative of the kingdoms and nations of men. By the way, Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold represents your kingdom and the whole thing is coming down. So the first thing he does is he builds a gold statue. And then he says, hey, you need to bow down to worship it. And if you don't bow down to worship, I'm going to throw you into a fiery furnace. And Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they square off with him. And they say, we will not do it. They defied him. And Nebuchadnezzar throws them into the furnace. And we said last week that there is a furnace coming for all of us. And when we are in the midst of a furnace, figuratively speaking, in our lives, it's usually an emotional furnace of some kind, a spiritual furnace. But oftentimes when we pray, like our prayer is, God, would you extinguish the flames or rescue me out of? And very rarely do I pray at least, God, would you please be present with me in this? And I just said last week, the way, and Nebuchadnezzar noticed this. He just said, hey, there is a fourth inside the furnace. And, 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 he, and there is no other God that saves like this. And I just want just to remind you of this and to keep this at the forefront. Furnaces are inevitable. And in those moments, those are opportunities for intimacy with God. And if your prayer is, God, get me out of this, you miss his presence in that moment. And we see at the very end of chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar like, has this change of heart. And he's just like, man, there's no other God that saves like this. However, as we come to chapter four, we see that pride will not let go of his heart or your heart or mine without a fight. And we see that in chapter four, Nebuchadnezzar's heart has hardened once again. He's gotten distracted by the things of the world. But chapter four is gonna be God's knockout blow because he is pursuing human hearts. And I just wanna say this today, that right now there is somebody listening to this, watching this, sitting in this room that you're sitting in right now. And I just need you to know you are not here by accident. It might seem you are. Like it might seem like you woke up today and you're like, ah, oh, you know, I didn't plan on going to church, but I did. Or maybe you came today because somebody invited you. Or maybe you're here today because of somebody's ultimatum. You're here against your will, whatever it is. I just want you to know you're listening to this right now. Like it is no mistake. Like God wants you to listen to this because he is pursuing your heart. And there isn't anybody that is too far gone. There is nobody that is beyond the reach of God's grace or grasp. It doesn't matter what you've been. It doesn't matter where you've been. God is pursuing you today. And I want you to hear that. As long as there is breath in your lungs, God is not done. Okay? So that's just. uh... So here's where I want to catch you up to. As we come to the beginning of chapter four, this is Nebuchadnezzar at the peak of his success. Like he's at the peak of his earning power. Like he owns a vast majority of the empires around the world. And um, it is, uh, and he opens up chapter four, almost as if we are sort of sitting with Nebuchadnezzar around the campfire and he's just kind of telling us his story. He's just kind of sharing his testimony with us as if he's looking back and he says, hey, there was a time that I acknowledged God, but I didn't fully submit to him. And maybe that Uh, is representative of somebody today. Maybe that describes you. You acknowledge God, haven't really fully submitted to him. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, by all outward appearances, my life was a complete success. And I was at the pinnacle of luxury, comfort, and power. However, I'm reminded of something Abraham Lincoln said, where he said, any man can withstand adversity, but if you want to test his character, give him power. And we see that Nebuchadnezzar's got power. And at the peak of all of his quote unquote, ultimate success in the world's eyes, he just loses it emotionally and mentally. Like we're talking, he cracks up. We'll read it, we'll read it here in just a minute. 
But we're just talking like Nebuchadnezzar is wearing like an aluminum hat made of tinfoil. And he's got his underpants on the outside of his shorts, kind of crazy. Like that's, that's what's happening. And, and, uh, and so he is sent out like seven years uh, to kind of live on his own out in the wilderness. And then he returns to tell everyone what had happened. So I'm just kind of catching you up to speak because I just don't have time to read every single verse in chapter 4. But at the very beginning of chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. God, is pers- God has a word for Nebuchadnezzar through these dreams. And the first dream was about a statue. The second dream is about a tree. And this tree gets cut down. And Nebuchadnezzar brings in his spiritual advisory team once again, just like he did with the gold statue. And, you know, surprise, surprise, they have no idea how to interpret it. And so he brings in Daniel. And Daniel hears the dream. And Daniel is legitimately freaked out by it. Like Daniel is shaken when he hears this dream, but not for reasons that you might think. Daniel comes in and he's like, Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, this, this tree represents Nebuchadnezzar and it's going to get cut down. And Daniel is shaken by it. Now, um, if I was Daniel, I think I would actually find a little bit of satisfaction in sharing this with the guy who had enslaved me for so many years. Wouldn't you? Hey, I got a dream for you. <laughs> that tree is you and you're getting cut down. And I would just kind of enjoy that. Daniel doesn't. Look at Daniel's response in verse 19. Belteshazzar, uh, by the way, that's Daniel's Babylonian name, not to be confused with Belshazzar, which is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. All right, so these chapters are written in Aramaic. In other words, Daniel replied, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my Lord, and not to you. That's astounding. Like Daniel genuinely appears to love the man who sort of ruined his life. Now, now, he doesn't admire him, and he's not approving of everything that he does. But this is clear. He has grown to love him as a person, and he cares about his heart as well as his eternal future. Remember what I said a couple weeks ago? God is on a rescue mission, and Daniel sees this. He is seeing Nebuchadnezzar not as his arch enemy, but maybe the very guy that God sent him into exile to rescue. Because Nebuchadnezzar needed to hear this message. Brings up a real point of conviction for all of us today. Is that the way that you feel about the Nebuchadnezzars in your life? Like, is that the way that you feel about the combative, obnoxious Babylonians in your office? Or the ones that live down the street from you with their antagonistic bumper stickers, yard signs, and Facebook posts? Do you see them primarily as political opponents to overcome and shout down? Or people that you genuinely love, care, and pray for? But that's too convicting, so let's move on. Verse 22. (laughs) That tree, your majesty, is you, for you have grown strong and great, undeniable, like your worldly power, super strong. Your greatness reaches up to heaven, but kind of like a Jenga tower, and your rule to the ends of the earth. And in the following verses, he goes on to explain that the tree's gonna be cut down, but the stump and the roots will remain. And surrounded by that will be fertile grass, uh, which is representative of the fact that there's still hope. Now, verse 25. You will be driven from human society and you will live in the fields with the wild animals. (laughs) Thus the aluminum hat and the underpants on the outside of your shorts. You will eat grass like a cow. You will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time, that's roughly seven years, will pass before, well, while you live this way. And now get this, this next verse, I think is one of the, is the key statement in the entire book of Daniel. Some of us need to print this out and put it above our television sets when we watch the news and when we are on social media. Until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. Doesn't matter what's going on in the world, how far the wheels seem to have come off. God rules with his feet up. He is not surprised by anything that is happening in the world. And we need to be reminded of that. Verse 26, but the stump and roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. So he's not opposed to them having a kingdom. He just wants you to have a kingdom to steward it through the lens that heaven rules. Verse 27, King Nebuchadnezzar, I love this. Please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue 
to prosper. Now, Daniel gives that to him, and then God gives Nebuchadnezzar roughly a year to respond, which I think is astounding and incredibly gracious. Not to mention the fact that he's already gone through the previous three chapters with everything that's gone on there. Now God has given him an additional year to repent, change his mind, and turn around. And I'm reminded of 2 Peter chapter 3. God is not slow in keeping his promises, but patient. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is so incredibly patient with us. And it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. But... The day finally came when Nebuchadnezzar's heart did not change. He continued to rebel. He continued to be prideful. And a line was crossed. And God said, okay, that's enough. Like you have walked in disobedience long enough. And so now to really get your attention, you're going to lose your kingdom. And I'm going to send you out into the wilderness for seven years. And I just want you to know that there is a line in the sand for, for all of us where God actually in his mercy will say to you and me, okay, that's enough. Like you've walked in disobedience long enough. And for some of you, maybe you're thinking, well, you know, I mean, that happened a long time ago and I haven't gotten caught yet. Like that, that thing, I've, I've managed to kind of keep that part of my life hidden in the closet, kind of, you know, underneath the shadows for a long time. Nothing bad has happened yet. I think I'm okay. But it's pride that's causing you to think that. And there is a line in the sand where God, God will allow you and me, through free will, just to continue to go on, maybe in our disobedience. But eventually he'll say, man, enough is enough. And God will send something to strike the foundation of the tower that we've been building. And it could be anything. It could be the loss of a relationship. It could be an unwanted divorce. It could be an affair. It could be a bankruptcy. It could be a health thing. God will, and it, and it actually seems like this really terrible thing. But what is it, it is doing? It is causing the veil to drop from our eyes to where what we were originally blinded to, now we can see it. And God in his mercy is drawing us back to himself. And that happened in Nebuchadnezzar. He is standing in chapter four, uh, on top of, you know, his empire. He's looking out. He's kind of admiring it all, boasting about his accomplishments. And then it says in verse 33, Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. And he ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of heaven. And he lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird claws. So get the visual in your mind. The most powerful dude on earth was reduced to a madman. And his hair's all grown out. His fingernails are all gnarly. You know, we're not talking no shave or, um, you know, no haircut November. We're talking seven long years of no haircuts, hot baths, or hygiene. And God was using Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar to give us a picture of what happens to people, nations, and societies when we rebel against God. Um, and we're kind of in it right now. Like right now, like when you turn on the news, when you watch social media, it's just like long hair and gnarly fingernails, right? It's like we are just, we've just off the rails. God's like, hey, I'm just going to let you in your rebellion. This is, and this is why I think that right now, and I've been trying to just encourage us with this, is right now is an opportunity. Right now is the time to shine a bright light. Why? Because the world is honestly like freaking out. All the ideologies that they've been bowing down to, that they've been told would give their life meaning, purpose, and an identity is evaporating before their eyes and they're freaking out. And now's the time for calm-minded, compassionate, steady-footed Christ followers to have, to have the spirit of the living God within them to stand and to live unapologetically in winsome ways. And so in Nebuchadnezzar's own words, he says in verse 37, uh, because he actually, uh, he goes away and then he ends up coming back. God restores his kingdom. Here's what Nebuchadnezzar says, the very end of chapter four. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true and he is able to humble the proud. And I love this because the way that Nebuchadnezzar's story had been trending, I mean, be honest. Like if you didn't know anything about it, you'd be like, man, his story ain't in a good, like that's gonna go end in, a, in just this, you know, he's gonna flame out. But it appears is if he genuinely repented and genuinely gave his life to God. And that gives me such hope. Get not only hope for me, 
in my rebellion and my pride, but hope that to recognize that there might be somebody and you just think, man, they, they would never come to know Christ. Man, you never give up. You never count them out because God is pursuing hearts. Now, as we uh, transition into chapter five, uh, here's what I want you to see is that uh, Nebuchadnezzar is long gone and his great grandson, a guy by the name of Belshazzar, needs to learn the exact same lesson. That's usually the case. So understand the year is 539 BC. This is about 70 years after Daniel has been brought to Babylon as a captive. So Daniel is a very old man now. He's over 80 years old. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar has been dead for about 23 years. And his super spoiled, uh, extremely entitled grandson is now in power. And he throws this huge kegger with a bunch of his friends. They are partying like it is 539 BC. Okay, so look at verse two. <laughs> While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, his grandpa, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink with them, with his nobles, his wives, and his girlfriends, all right? So uh, this big, big party going on. And uh, he says in the middle of the party, he's like, hey, I got an idea. Um, here's the key to my grandpa's storage unit. And inside are all the silver and the gold goblets that were the Israelites. This, this is God's property way back when. And uh, let's open this up. Ezra 1 tells us that they had, Nebuchadnezzar had stolen 5,000 different items that belonged to God. And so he goes, hey, man, you think that this party's been great, you know, drinking out of these little shot glasses. Wait till you drink out of God's silver and gold goblets. And so they go and they bring all these in to really get the party going. Verse 5. Suddenly, they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. Notice how detailed that is. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. Um, the literal translation of verse 6 is that he wet himself. And I would have too. I mean, just imagine, like you're in the middle of this party and all of a sudden a severed, detached hand appears in the air and starts writing on the wall. And we'll read what it writes here in just a minute, but um, it's not good, all right? And so uh, he brings in his, his spiritual advisor team, just like his grandpa did all those years ago. His, his musicians, his astrologers. And he's like, hey guys, tell me what this means. And surprise, surprise, they cannot History has a way of repeating itself. So there they are. And um, Belshazzar's grandma is at the party. Apparently she liked to rock it out too. All right. So she's there and she sees all this. And she, she goes over to her grandson and she says, Hey, I'm reminded of a guy that used to be on your grandpa's payroll named Daniel. And Daniel interpreted stuff like this for your grandpa. I think if you brought him in, he might be able to help you. Now, keep in mind, Daniel is well over 80 years old at the time. He has long left public life. So I don't know where he's at. He's kicking it at the nursing home or something. And so they, they bring him in. And um, uh, he says to, she says to Belshazzar, This man, Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar, has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel. He will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought in before the king. And uh, Belshazzar says to him, I am told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you will be clothed in purple robes of royal honor and you will have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And I love how Daniel answered him. I cannot wait to be an old man who just doesn't care anymore. <laughs> I think it would just be so great. Daniel's like in there, he's like, man, I don't care about your wardrobe. He's like, keep your gifts and give them to someone else. But I'll tell you what the dream means, right? So, or what the writing means. I love that so much. And so he kind of gives um, Belshazzar kind of a little bit of a history lesson. Like, hey, here's, here's what happened with your granddad and God. And so now he says in verse 22, you are his successor, O Belshazzar. And you knew all of this. You knew the history lessons. Yet you have not humbled yourself. For you proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups from his temples brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives and concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising the false gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Sounds like the statue, doesn't it? 
gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you've not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is the message that was written. Meeny, meeny, tekel, parson. And this is what the words mean. Meeny means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Tekel means weighed. You have been weighed on the balances, have not measured up. Parson means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes, a gold chain was hung around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. But that very night, Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed. So what I want you to understand is that while this party was raging on, what was happening is that less than 50 miles away, the army of the Medes and the Persians came together to form one mega army to attack the Babylonian empire to take them down once and for all. And that night Babylon would be overthrown and Belshazzar and all the royal family would die. Now this is a story of how God will ultimately bring down prideful, rebellious, unjust Babylonian empires and keep his promise to restore his people to their promised land. But it is also a picture that tells us how God confronts the pride and the rebellion in our own hearts in all people's times and places. So I want to give you three questions of application just to do a little bit of self-reflection on your own. Like later today, maybe this is in your quiet time later this week, and I'm really, really grateful to Pastor J.D. Greer and some of his work on this because what it did was it stimulated my own thinking on this, and this is where some of these questions came out of. Here's the, the first question I just want to present to you, and it's simply this. Um, is there anything that I'm numbing out with? What am I numbing out with? Now, let me explain by wh what I mean by that. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with this image right here uh, of an iceberg. And an iceberg, you know, you only see uh, a small portion of it above the surface, but you see there's all this other stuff underneath the surface. What I want you to do is I want you just to um, imagine that as an analogy for your heart, the seat of your emotions, like your spiritual health, your emotional health, the stuff that's going on. So, you know, um, we oftentimes present in which we just show people what's going on above the surface, but there's a whole bunch of things that are going on beneath the surface, whether we are aware of it or not. And we can be aware of what's going on underneath the surface of our hearts and really dig in there and do some work and submit and resubmit that to God. Or we can just stuff it and stuff it and ignore it and numb out on other things and distractions so that we don't have to do the heart work. But eventually it'll come to the surface. This is like um, my counselor will oftentimes talk about this as deep heart work. And he'll ask me a question every now and then when I talk to him. He'll go, hey, Aaron, how's your heart? And sometimes when I'm being lazy, I'll go, oh, that's good. It's good. And he's like, no, 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 man. You can't answer that way. Like, what's going on underneath the surface of your heart? Is there anything you're suppressing or repressing? See, we all have maybe some sort of pain, some sort of trauma, some sort of junk that we're going through, some unmet expectations, some things that get hung up down there because we're human. And if we don't deal with it in, in healthy ways, it'll come to the surface in very unhealthy ways. So um, I've got a friend who said that oftentimes he's got an anger issue. And he said, but really, Aaron, all my anger is, is my fears and my insecurities and my pressures coming out as anger. Like there's all these things I'm not really dealing with and it comes out in sideways ways. Now, some of you are like, Aaron, where are you going with this? Uh, I think this is what was happening with Belshazzar at the party. Belshazzar, I would imagine, we don't know a lot about him. I would imagine he probably had a pretty jacked up childhood in Babylon. I would imagine that he grew up extremely rich, extremely entitled and extremely lonely. He probably had anything that he wanted and it wasn't good for his soul. And, and it, I think that what's really unusual about this party in 539 BC is that as we've already read, the Medes and the Persians were less than 50 miles away getting ready to attack, but it was not a surprise attack. Belshazzar knew it. He was aware that they were getting ready to attack his empire. And instead of responding to that, instead of doing anything about it, he chooses to just throw this big party and to bring these, you know, silver and gold goblets uh, out of storage to drink out of. 
And you're kind of like asking yourself, why? Why, why would he do that? And, and maybe it's because he was trying to put on a brave front for the rest of the people. Maybe it, was trying, maybe it was because he was trying to drown out his problems with alcohol and sex. We often do that. Maybe he was so out of touch with reality, he thought Babylon was invincible no matter what. Um, there's a uh, Jewish atheist philosopher by the name of Ernst Becker who said this in his book, The Denial of Death. And he said that when all of us face our own mortality, we often turn to one of three things to console and distract us. The first is reputation. We just focus on our reputation. We're just carefully crafting our image. We're working on our career. What are our contributions to the world? Not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but it can become something that we numb out with. We're just totally focused on that. And we see this in the life of Belshazzar. The second is romance. We turn to maybe the thrill of intimacy or maybe in a twisted way, uh, empty sex or porn. And we're seeking to fill that emptiness in our heart through intimacy and it never fulfills it. And we see this with Belshazzar with his wives and concubines at the party. The third would be religion where we seek to be worthy through our efforts and pious living. And we think, well, hopefully uh, when it's all said and done, you know, when I get up to the pearly gates, hopefully I've done enough good things to tip the scales in my direction and God will let me in, which is not the gospel message. The gospel message is not religion where you try to earn your way to God. The gospel message is God has already done for you on your behalf, which you could never do on your own. And Belshazzar toasted uh, the false gods. And we see all three of these in his Life. I'm just wondering, do you see these in yours? Steve Jobs, Apple's legendary founder and CEO, was asked on 60 Minutes right before he died whether he believed in God or not. And he said throughout his lifetime, there would have been some seasons when he had and some seasons when he had not. But he said, after I was diagnosed with cancer, I found myself wanting to believe. And here's what he said. It can't just be that when we die, it all fades to black. Like all the accomplishments, all the wisdom, all the things that we have learned somehow have to live on. And incidentally, he said, that's why he never liked to put on-off switches on Apple devices. Because he didn't like the idea of being able to flip a switch and something shut off. So can I just ask you, is there anything that you're numbing out with? You're just distracted so that you don't have to deal with the condition of your soul. Here's the second question. What voices am I listening to? What voices are informing the way that I see the world? And we need to pay attention to that. Throughout the study of Daniel, a repeated pattern is that we see that the trusted voices in Babylon, the astrologers, the magicians, the enchanters, they could never come through when it really mattered. And they failed the king over and over and over again. And Daniel proved over and over again that there is a God who has spoken. He is speaking and he will speak. And his word rings true. Jesus is described in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word. And uh, he, was, he was the word. And it, he, God is speaking today, sharper than any double-edged sword, and he is able to penetrate. So can I just ask you, what voices are you listening to to make sense of this world and your life? And some of you might be like, well, you know, I, I listen to the voices of science. Well, man, I think that's great. I don't think that we need to disparage or dismiss science, but I do think we need to frame it and to understand just uh, what science can speak to and w what it can't. Science can certainly tell you what happens and, and you know, how things kind of work around the world, but they can't necessarily tell you why. It can't speak to your purpose or what's right and wrong. Uh, it's limited in its scope. Maybe the voices that you're listening to are, are the politicians. And maybe for you, you're like, that's where the answer has got to be. But, and, and certainly they have unique contributions to make. But I think that we would all agree are largely unsuccessful in dealing with some of life's greatest problems. They always come up short. Maybe it's the voices of education or entertainment or sports. Maybe it's some sort of social media feed or maybe it's some sort of news outlet. I just want you to know that no matter where or what you're listening to, oftentimes you will find that it comes up short when providing real answers. And it's a lot of noise. And through all the noise, God is speaking. The question is, is if I turn down the other voices so that I can hear him clearly. We're moving so fast and things are on all the time that when do we just get quiet for a minute and say, God, I'm listening. 
please speak. Here's the third and the last question. Admittedly, this is going to sound a little strange, but here's the question. Am I aware of the finger of God in my life? Now, inevitably, somebody's going to write that down wrong in their notes and say, God gives me the finger. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> am, am I aware of the finger of God in my life? Maybe, maybe a less weird way to say it is, am I aware of the hand of God in my life? Now, taking, taking us back to chapter 5, Belshazzar's big party, man, that would be so weird. Just all of a sudden have this like floating detached hand, start writing on the wall. Kind of reminds me of an old episode of the Adams Family, if any of you remember that show. It just seems so crazy and so random, like, like what is going on here? However, however, this isn't the first time we've seen a, the finger of God on like a hand communicating in some way. For those of you that know your Old Testament history, the first time we see it is in Exodus chapter 8, when Moses squared off with the Egyptian magicians in Pharaoh's court. And they're sort of having this like, you know, match back and forth. And uh, with a staff, you know, it's like Moses' staff turns to a snake. And, and they're, they're kind of matching him, like uh, match for match. And at one point, Moses takes a staff, he throws it on the ground, and it becomes a bunch of gnats. And the magicians immediately turn to Pharaoh and they go, we're out. We can't do that. And then this is where they say it. They say that is the finger of God. Second time we read about it is in Exodus 31. Moses is coming down off Mount Sinai. He's got the two tablets uh, with the Ten Commandments. And he says to the Israelites, these were etched into stone by the finger of God. So now we've got the third instance of this at Belshazzar's party. And all of a sudden you see this floating detached hand starts writing on the wall. Meaning, meaning, your days are numbered. And by the way, all of our days are numbered. Last time I checked, mortality rates still pinned at about 100%. <laughs> Tickle, you are measured and found deficient, which means no amount of good works, good behavior, or intentions will earn right favor with God. And by the way, that's good news because God already paid it all. Right? You don't bring anything to the table. It's, it's Jesus and nothing else. Right? So he says to Belshazzar, hey, all of your efforts, it's going to be deficient. And then the last thing is Parson. Your stuff will be divided up for others to plunder. Meaning, man, work hard, be a success, but just realize you ain't taking it with you to heaven. There's no U-Hauls behind hearses. Okay? So he says this very, uh, very sobering thing. Right? Meany, meany, tickle Parson. XO, XO. Okay? And I just want to ask you, is there an area of your life where God has been trying to get your attention? Maybe for years. And in the example of Nebuchadnezzar, God's grace and his patience lasted decades. In the example of Belshazzar, it was that night. We are not guaranteed another day. So the question is, is that now, now I don't think that you're going to go home today and see a floating severed hand in your closet. Like, I hope not. Like, I, I, don't, I don't want that for you. But it, does mean that, but it does mean that God is speaking right now. Um, uh, in fact, um, scholars say that the finger of God thing is not meant to be like, you know, um, a scary thing. It just means this. The finger of God represents a direct word from God containing the power of God without a human messenger to relay it. Now, God speaks through human messengers. Uh, I hope so, because that's kind of what I'm doing right now. All right, I'd be out of a job if he didn't. And God spoke through Daniel, and God spoke through the prophets. But there are sometimes there was a message that was so urgent, God didn't need to. And it was the finger of God is what represented it, and it was this conviction that went straight to the heart. So I'm just asking, are you listening to what God is saying to you today? And you're not guaranteed another day. Like, act on that right now. You want to know, um, there's another place in which we hear about the finger of God. It's in the New Testament. You want to know who described himself as the finger of God? It's found in Luke chapter 11. Jesus is talking. And Jesus says, if I'm casting out demons by the power of God, and in the Greek, that's actually translated to finger of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. So Jesus is describing himself as the finger of God. So in the Old Testament, this is God showing up with no other um, mediator. In the New Testament, Jesus is like, I am God in the flesh. Jesus would often do miracles 
uh, to show evidence that this was the hand of God at work. Jesus would say, you want to know what God is like? Then look at me. He would say to Thomas, who was, had genuine doubts in his mind about the resurrection, he would say, Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In Romans 12, it says, through Christ, God engraved his law on our hearts. And through Jesus, we are given a message just like Belshazzar, that there is a way to come back to God today. The question is, is are you going to respond to it and receive it? Or are you going to continue to ignore it, party, be distracted and numb out? And that's the question today. And maybe for some of you, you'll respond to that right now today. Like, man, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to, I want to respond just like Nebuchadnezzar did, because I know that there isn't anybody that is too far gone from God's grace. Others of you, though, that maybe responded to Jesus a long time ago, maybe the message of application for you is you are right now a follower of Jesus, but you are discouraged in Babylon. And you look around and you're like, man, God, why are all these Babylonians in charge? Have you fallen asleep at the wheel? Like, how much longer is this going to go? And I just want to gently remind you that Daniel lived faithfully for God in a godless culture for an entire generation. But that didn't mean that God had fallen asleep at the wheel. We see evidence of God's power all through the book of Daniel. And chapter 5 shows us that God has been, still is, and always will be in charge. And he will have the final word. And our hope is not in our circumstances, but it is in him and it is in him alone. And so what I just want to do as we close out our time together is I, I just want us to just maybe spend a moment in silence. And I just want to, you know, we, we do a lot of talking. We, we talk about God. We talk to God. We have discussions around all this. But when's, when's the last time you just really stopped and just were quiet? And so I just want, not, not for long, but just a few moments here. I just want us to be quiet. And may the disposition of our hearts be God, we, we're listening. W would you speak? And so just a few seconds of silence, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'll have you stand to your feet, and we'll respond in song. God, would you forgive me when my life is so full of noise that I've crowded you out? Forgive me when I numb out to things that maybe aren't bad, but they're distracting me from paying attention to the stuff that's going on underneath the surface of my life. And so God, I ask that in the quietness of these few moments that you would be present, that you would speak, that we know that it is your patience and your kindness that leads us to this place of repentance. And so I pray in this moment right now, this would be a defining moment for somebody's life. This would be the moment where they said, you know what, enough is enough. I'm not gonna walk in disobedience any longer. I'm not gonna be distracted any longer. I'm gonna pay attention to the voice of God in my life. I'm gonna come back to the place I never should have left to begin with. And God, we're so thankful for your grace. We're so thankful that there isn't anybody that has out your grace for us, that we can always be reached. And so God, I pray that we would respond right now. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for being a sovereign God who is in control when things seem so out of control. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said,